two miles in the morning watch found the Sophie sailing steadily eastward along the 39th parallel, with the wind just abaft her beam. The sky was still grey, and it was impossible to say whether it was clear or covered with a high cloud. But the sea itself already had an aqueous light that belonged more to the day than to the darkness. He is certainly one of the most unlikely celebrities imaginable. And yet, wherever this literary phenomenon reads from his works, large, reverential crowds assemble. They will especially cherish one of his volumes if he inscribes his name on the title page. Patrick O'Brien. You've given us such pleasure. Oh, how very kind of you. Thank you. While in this country, people are learning about uh, Captain Audrey, which is great, man. It's just strange how it spreads. Why did it take so long for the United States to, to catch on? I've never understood. Never understood. O'Brien was already an established writer of fiction and biography before he tried to exploit his youthful sailing experience in his work. Then, over a period of 25 years, he wrote a series of sea novels about the Napoleonic era that were a great critical success in England and Ireland. Beautiful writer, lovely writer, just moves the story along so magnificently. Walter Cronkite was an early devotee who even imported the books before they were published in the United States so he could follow the adventures of O'Brien's two heroes, British Navy Captain Jack Aubrey and his best friend and shipmate, Dr. Stephen Maturin. It's marvelous, the discovery of the uh, battery by the by the American public. The great difficulty was convincing most of my literate friends that there was, could be anything well written about an, an, another uh, sea battle story. In connection with the publication of The Wine Dark Sea, the 16th book in the series, O'Brien and his wife Mary left their home in the south of France for a rare visit to the United States. In Boston, he toured a ship that figures in a number of his books, the USS Constitution. And when you consider, when you consider the way English frigates of, of equal glory are just broken up, it, it's, it's heartbreaking. It's uh, the uh, international code of signals for O'Brien. Who is it indeed? <laughs> How very pretty of you to put that. That gives you a ludicrous degree of pleasure. At the South Street Seaport Museum in New York, he visited, what else? A great sailing vessel. This is uh, Peking, which uh, has been around the horn any number of times, oh. originally as a nitrate carrier. First efforts by an American publisher to market his books were unsuccessful. It wasn't until O'Brien was into his 70s that the novels were given a second chance here by publisher W.W. W. Norton. Now they are selling by the tens of thousands, and this Irish writer is finally hailed not just as a creator of historical fiction, but as one of the best novelists of the century. You have created a new kind of addict in New York. We have all kinds of, of addicts that we, we worry about, and, and uh, just, uh, you have made us uh, addicts of, of your good works and your characters, and we want to thank you. The entire creative process is profoundly mysterious to me. I don't know. I, I know what to do once the elements have presented themselves and how to arrange them, but how they come into a state of crystallization, that's completely mysterious to me. At the Navy Museum in Washington, O'Brien found artifacts and accounts of the centuries he loves to write about. I was perfectly, I say perfectly, virtually perfectly at home in the 18th, early 19th century. It had become apparent to me that this was a matter that suited me very well, and for a writer, a writer interested primarily in the exploration of human relations rather than mere fun and adventure, though I'm not at all against fun or adventure, that that was a very good milieu in which the people could revolve. Another major theme in the O'Brien saga 
is the intense passion of Dr. Stephen Maturin for all manifestations of natural life. Some people even think Maturin speaks for the author. I think it's probably the best bird ex exhibit I've ever seen, and I feel a lot. And O'Brien clearly shares his interest in nature. He gloried in his visit to the Bronx Zoo. He's an extraordinarily improbable creature. Uh, rock nesting wader. Rock I mean, nesting wader. It, 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 he's a much handsomer bird than I should ever have expected. And at the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia, he was delighted to heft the tusk of a narwhal. But to wear that in front of, uh, of your person, it, it, it seems to be perfectly disproportionate, even if one is a narwhal. <laughs> <laughs> now, am I right in thinking that we can expect a few more books here? I mean, you're not going well, to let this drop. Oh, dear, no. I mean, unless, unless there's grave misfortune, I hope so to go on for quite a time. Rest easy, readers. Another book is on the way to add to the shelf of 16 volumes. And Do we have a title for it? No, we haven't. I just okay. call it. I call it seventeen. Seventeen. All right. I, I, I won't say very much, but I'll say this: that uh, Jack and Stephen coming back will find their respective spouses not quite as they left them. Ah, no, I can't wait. <laughs> and neither can thousands of fans like these at the National Archives in Washington. Have it opened up a whole new world. Oh, I'm so glad, so glad. Again and again, people say that I've given them a great deal of pleasure. Oh, absolutely. And that, you know, it, it does please one. Children need mothering, of course, but then so do dreams. Hopes and aspirations have to be nurtured, too, so that they may become realities. In some ways, that is the writer's job, to give birth to dreams, and then to mother those dreams until they grow great enough to walk by themselves through the world, to change us for the better. That, at any rate, is the mission of the writer Jerry Bowen would like us now to meet. This is where I go to recharge, you know, and uh, I just love it out in the woods and out in the wilds, and so I feel at home here. Home for writer Alice Walker is the coastal wine country north of San Francisco. It is her refuge from the troubled world she ponders and writes about, delivering opinions both informed and emotionally driven, things she simply knows in her heart to be true. I think what most concerns me is that I don't know if people will learn to like being awake long enough to make a change. I think that people really on some level like being asleep. Like Walker being sees a world too dominated by corporations and conventional religion. She is, quite proudly, a pagan, by her own definition, one who worships Mother Earth. When you're here, is it easier to uh, feel hopeful? It is, it is, because the earth is always doing something. And I have never known the earth not to give a spring. You know, every year there's spring. One begins to see the world from one's own point of view. Her point of view has made author Alice Walker an activist. A peaceful point of view she hopes will inspire a revolution. One person at a time taking a stand for what is right. Small acts can be very powerful, and that is what I'm talking about. But I've seen in my life, because I've lived long enough now, to really see that uh, you just do what you, you can, and you never know what it's going to become. You know, you write out of your experience, you write out of what you read, you write out of everything. You bring it all to the page. But then the curious thing is that once you bring it all to the page, you, you basically forget how you got there, you know? And, and then it seems like it's magic. Alice Walker, the author, writes from her heart and head, stories drawn from memories and visions of the future. Alice Walker, the activist, 
speaks and writes from experience, years of experiences collected behind the cover of her latest book, Anything We Love Can Be Saved. As, uh, as an author, as a writer and activist, do those two roles feed off each other? Are they separate? Oh, they, they do. They do. They're very, they're very um, much the same in a way because, you know, over time I realize it's those moments when I have been really profoundly moved, angered, uh, saddened, um, challenged that I feel I have to creatively respond. One of those times was at age 13. She saw the blown away face of a poor, hardworking neighbor woman shot by her husband. Walker remembers looking at the woman's feet. And she still had on one shoe and had a piece of paper stuck in it to cover the hole in the sole. Um, and I knew this was a good woman. I knew this was a good person. And I knew no one should have harmed her. Uh, and I knew that somehow, some place in me was profoundly stirred. And I knew that if I ever grew up myself, I would get to the bottom of what I thought was this story. And it would be about poverty, and it would be about rage, and it would be about oppression, and it would be about sexism and misogyny. All of these words, of course, were words then I didn't know anything about hardly. But I knew that I would learn how to tell her story. Telling that story and others became Walker's life work. Her most popular novel, the Pulitzer Prize winning The Color Purple, sold over five million copies. It remains one of the most respected books in American literature. The Color Purple also earned her an enormous following from all walks of life, including women she met with recently at Boston's Pine Street Inn, a shelter for homeless and battered women. All the things that happened to me, them are my feelings and them are my, my secrets. What were you thinking as, as you heard several of these women bear their souls or their, some of the hard times they've been through? Until you can say what it is, you can't really see it. So I know they're on the way and I'm just you know happy to be the person that they could talk to. At a celebration of activism in Washington, D.C., benefiting the National Black Women's Health Project, Walker heard the music of Sweet Honey in the Rock, singers and songs she's written about as an inspiration to her activism. Or we can spend them consciously embracing every glowing soul. And the celebration featured Walker's own words, read by others who share her beliefs and vision. Congresswoman Maxine Waters. If we are to be treasures, let us demand to be treasured. These are some of the women who reminded Alice Walker of her mother, the strong and hard-working mother who made a beautiful home from a sharecropper's shack and worked the field so her children could go to school. So if my mother, with her one home, can look out there at a field that's 30 acres large and clear it, we can make sure that every black woman on earth is healthy. Not all her causes are popular. Walker believes the Palestinian people are victims of Israeli colonialism. That convicted murderer, Mumia Abu Jamal, now on Pennsylvania's death row for killing a cop, is innocent. That US trade embargoes are killing innocent Cuban people. That contrary to his critics' beliefs, Fidel Castro is a man to admire. Fidel Castro respects poor people, and, he, and I can see that when I go to Cuba. And I really uh, admire Fidel because he has tried. He has tried to make a difference in the lives of poor people. And uh, that is why I like him. Right or wrong, Alice Walker is a radical and an optimist, a writer of strong opinions gently delivered. And she has earned her place among the great authors, those who both aggravate and inspire, and tell a good story along the way. So instead of throwing a bomb, I can you know, write a novel. So you cannot really change consciousness uh, by murdering. 
you know, people who are brutalizing them. You can only change it, I think, by very patiently actually uh, creating a vision of a different kind of world. And so that's what I do. This is the kind of house that shimmers into life in the daydreams of esthetes. It's odd, therefore, that author William Styron should here have created that other darker world, which is the setting of his novel, Sophie's Choice. Styron, laden with literary honors for such works as Lie Down in Darkness and The Confessions of Nat Turner, has lost none of the steady purpose, which he calls didacticism, or the obligation of the novelist to teach, to reveal new truths, in this case, those which are found in the grim confines of the concentration camps. Does it surprise and please you that a book with this somber theme is heading for the top of the bestseller list? I mean, aside from just your pleasure of success as a writer, does it please you? I think it does. I think it, it's not only testimony to, to whatever faith I used to complete the book, faith in myself, but also I have a feeling that, that people are responding to the book because it is saying something rather important about 20th century America. And uh, it is true that this is not necessarily a component of being very high on the bestseller list always, but I think in this case it is. Do you think that we are much now obsessed as a nation with the various forms of guilt because of our own recent history, and that may rouse some interest? Yeah, I think that that's a, possibly a, 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 a part of it. Uh, I think, I don't think that it is possible, for instance, to, to equate Vietnam with Auschwitz. I, I think that's a, 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 a bad idea. I don't think the two th uh, resemble each other in the slightest. Uh, but I do think that we are aware that our foray into Vietnam was a, a, an act of evil, and that whereas it was not an act of total domination in the sense that Auschwitz was, that possibly some of our, our, our guilt uh, is co coinciding with, with the guilt that one feels about Auschwitz as a human. This book, Sophie's Choice, is in your mind linked philosophically with Nat Turner, and it's linked with your early work, isn't it? I think that there's one very important, almost central theme that I, I myself have, have rediscovered in my own work, which is that of domination and slavery. I think that it's been a part of my work from the beginning, and that maybe it re has reached its culmination here, in, in the sense that we now know that, that Auschwitz was not just an extermination camp, but a place which for the first time saw human beings enslaving other human beings on the level that they enslaved uh, each other back in the 19th century. And that this, I think, is an important aspect of the story because it, 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 it demonstrates that if it happened as recently as Auschwitz, which was only 30 some years ago, it could happen again. Have you had any criticism from people who say he is an American non-Jewish writer? It is not, and he has chosen as a protagonist a non-Jewish woman who has been in the camp. He is taking away what belongs to us. You know, I went through that once before with a, a novel that, that was called The Confessions of Nat Turner, which is still very much around. And I was determined that uh, that uh, I was not going to allow myself intentionally to be exposed to the same attacks that came to me then, which was that I had stolen a black hero. I don't think in Sophie's Choice I have um, done anything but, uh, but, but describe my own personal vision of what's, what Auschwitz was, the fact that I'm a, 
Virginia-born uh, American uh, is, seems to me uh, totally immaterial. Early in Sophie's Choice, Stingo, the character who speaks for you, says, somehow I seem always to end up writing about evil. What is it in you that drives you to this particular group of subjects? You develop certain themes very early. Uh, you don't know why they obsess you, why they haunt you, uh, but they do. And uh, so they continue to preoccupy you throughout your writing life. I know that uh, when I began to write my first novel, A Lie Down in Darkness, I realized uh, halfway through the book that I was much involved with evil. Uh, uh, evil, but also good, or to be more specific, uh, something I believe even more to be the antithesis of evil, which is love, and that that has uh, guided my uh, writing life for many years. Why, I don't know. Well, now, in about halfway through Sophie's Choice, you have the phrase, and you must quote it exactly, let love flow out on everyone. On or all living things. On all living things. This is, uh, is this the banner that you hold up against evil? I think after dealing with a, a, an almost uh, cosmically incomprehensible theme as, as Auschwitz, that uh, my hero and my narrator hero in, in almost self-defense felt compelled to say, uh, uh, let your love flow out on all living things just as, uh, as a, uh, a, a, a desperate last measure against uh, evil. For Marcel Proust, a piece of cake and a cup of tea provided enough memories for seven volumes. For William Styron, in the few lonely weeks he spent on this Brooklyn street, drew the metaphorical map for a world which stretched from Auschwitz to Flatbush. With all due respect to, to the survivors of Auschwitz and to what happened there, I think there's been an unnecessarily sacrosanct uh, feeling about the place that, that somehow the evil was so great that, uh, that, it, that we cannot speak about it. Uh, the uh, German philosopher Adorno said there could be no poetry after Auschwitz. I just don't believe this. I believe if anything it's going to call on, my book is one example, but I think it's going to call on ever increasing resources of art to try and understand it. And that's why I've, I've felt with great humility, I hope, that nonetheless I had to break the silence. Several years ago, I talked to a man I knew who was handy with a bulldozer into damming up the narrow wash behind my house. This was not a creek by any stretch of imagination, even so thirsty an imagination as mine. It was only a little... The Arizona desert near Tucson is where writer Barbara Kingsolver has chosen to put down roots. And with the kind of hard-won optimism she shares with many of her fictional characters, she willed her little corner of the desert to bloom. When the rains came, my pond filled. Its level rises and falls some, but for years now it has remained steadfastly pond, a small blue eye in the blistered face of desert. It was really hard for me at any point to say aloud, I'm a writer. It's still hard. How do I know? I mean, I've written some books, but how do I know I could write another one? I'm not sure. Uh, every day, it's, it's, it's like walking to the edge of the Pacific and looking out there and saying, well, I know I can swim, but Japan? Lovers of metaphor take heart. Barbara Kingsolver has written another book, a collection of nonfiction essays to be published this week. It's called High Tide in Tucson. No matter what I think I'm beginning a story about, I dig and I dig and I get to the bottom and discover that I'm writing about the same thing, which is 
how to fit being an individual in a society that glorifies individual achievement, how to integrate that with the necessity and, and the wonder of belonging to a community. Everything I write is about that. In Barbara Kingsolver's first novel, The Bean Trees, a feisty young woman named Taylor Greer finds herself in Tucson with a broken down Volkswagen and an abandoned three-year-old Indian girl. This is charm. She wrote it when she was pregnant with her daughter, Camille. I was a pregnant insomniac, so I just wrote and wrote and wrote. I didn't know I was writing a novel, but there you go, that's what it was. And literally the day I brought home Camille from the hospital, I got this call from New York saying, your novel will be published, and I was astonished. And my life has never been the same. After the bean trees came animal dreams, and then pigs in heaven, about the continuing journey of Taylor Greer and the Indian girl Turtle. I wrote a, a novel about a woman who finds her ba finds a baby in a car and then people thought that I found my child in a car, which I didn't. And <laughs> then I wrote a novel about a woman whose sister was killed, and n my own sister gets all this completely gratuitous sympathy for being dead, which she isn't. And she would be the first to tell you that. And all along, through a painful divorce and grueling book tours, she has tried to protect her private self and to be a good mother to her daughter, Camille. She writes about these things, too. I write a lot about the women, because I've mostly always been one. Um, I often get in college classes, if, you know, if they've just read The Bean Trees, let's say, and usually there's a kid who'll raise his hand, and he's going to ask the first question, and he'll say, isn't this a chick book? And what can I say? Um, isn't Moby Dick a whale book? Um, yes. Does Melville have to apologize for that? I don't think so. It looks like a paper plate. <laughs> Barbara Kingsolver was 22 when she headed for Tucson with a college degree in biology from DePaul University and a healthy disrespect for authority. I didn't think I'd come back for any reason, not even, you know, sort of acts of terrorism. <laughs> no one was more astonished than she when her alma mater asked her back to give the commencement address. I wrote a novel one time called Animal Dreams, and in it there are two sisters. One's a cynic and one's an optimist. The sister who believes in her own power has gone to Nicaragua to try to help people there make better lives for themselves. And she writes to her unhappy, cynical sister, trying to explain her course of action. And this is what she says. I don't expect to see perfection before I die. What keeps you going isn't some fine destination, but just the road you're on and the fact that you know how to drive. You keep your eyes open. You see this damned to hell world you got born into. And you ask yourself, what life can I live that will let me breathe in and out and love somebody or something and not run off screaming into the woods. I feel like a lonely voice when I read the newspaper, but then I go to the post office and there's this flood of, of letters falling out saying, yes, yes, Barbara, that's, that's, I like that story. And so, so I'm not lonely, I mean, I know that, that this country is a lot more humane um, and awake from the neck up than it seems to be from the, from the headlines. I've been shattered and reassembled a few times over, and there have been long days when I felt my heart was simply somewhere else, possibly on ice, in one of those igloo coolers that show up in the news as they are carried importantly onto helicopters.
Her own story has a happy ending. During this past year, Barbara Kingsolver was married to Stephen Hopp, an ornithologist whom she calls her keenest critic and purest enthusiast. Maybe I could have done it alone, she writes in the preface to High Tide in Tucson, but I sure wouldn't want to. I believe in happy endings. I really do. Not that anything ever really ends, but if you choose a happy moment and say, let's call this an ending, then you got yourself a happy ending. Kitten? What to believe in, exactly, may never turn out to be half as important as the daring act of belief. A willingness to participate in sunlight and the color red. An agreement to enter into a conspiracy with life on behalf of both frog and snake, the predator and the prey, in order to come away changed. A strange bus, the likes of which has not been seen in many a year, has been spotted roaming the roadways of the West Coast. Residents say it's like some ghost ship from days gone by. Either that, or the president of Greyhound has totally flipped out. Hi, cows. In 1964, Ken Kesey and his band of merry pranksters made a legendary cross-country trip. Now, a quarter of a century later, Ken Kesey's back on the magic bus. Up to the light and turn left. Up to the light and turn left. And up, up to the light and turn left. Up to the light and turn left. Why does it say right and turn only? Yep, left and green. Some say the 60s really started with parties at Ken Kesey's house in Palo Alto, where LSD was served. In fact, Kesey was bringing the LSD home from a CIA-sponsored testing program, where he was paid to take it. Twenty dollars a day. You went in at eight o'clock. They gave you one thing or another. I took psilocybin, mescaline, LSD. Uh, at age 25, Kesey wrote "One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest," a bestseller, which became a film that won the Academy Award for Best Picture. He wrote a second bestseller, Sometimes a Great Notion, and got on the bus, setting out for New York and taking lots of home movies along the way. The driver, Neil Cassidy, was already legendary, the model for the hero of Jack Kerouac's novel, On the Road. Author Tom Wolfe chronicled the growth of the counterculture around Kesey's parties, where his famous electric Kool-Aid was served and the Grateful Dead was the house band. Attitudes changed. After spending six months in jail on marijuana charges, Kesey retreated to Pleasant Hill, Oregon. He has been called the psychedelic conservative for his traditional lifestyle. He is a farmer, has been married for 36 years, and has a grandchild. I've always been, you know, far more conservative than Barry Goldwater can imagine, because I still believe in all that stuff. I don't, I haven't ever developed any kind of cynicism about the American dream. The reincarnation of the bus came about with the publication last month of a book by Kesey about the original bus trip. This is the original bus, 
which the Smithsonian Institute would like to have. And you see it's become very organic. Where the hole is in the roof, there's quite a lot of grass growing back there. This is today's replica. Time to roll, the weather saying go. Some of the original pranksters were aboard for the reunion voyage. Ken Babs, Mike Hagen, and Roy Seaberg, along with a whole new generation of pranksters, including Kesey's son, Zane. Kesey's nephew, Kit, was at the wheel. They set off three weeks ago on their bizarre journey, stopping first to campaign for Wavy Gravy, another 60s legend who was running for Berkeley City Council. He lost. They happened upon a sorority pledge class at Stanford. As always, the pranksters made quite an impression. Wow. <laughs> wow. Okay, would you like a little brief tour here? It starts back here in the primordial ooze when everything is dark and filmy and fishes are. Although pranksters were never ones to sermonize, on this trip, Kesey was offering up some 60s themes he feels have been salted away for too long. Lead you into the laid back Egyptian. This word here is. The word for enlightenment. So you don't think the revolution is dead, huh? Oh, Lord, no. Corpses? No, the revolution started when the first caveman handed a guy a bone to chew on instead of hitting him in the head. Uh, the first act of mercy and trust. Mm -hmm. And all the other cavemen said, what are you handing the bone for? And years later, you know why you hand him the bone. Because you want him as a friend. And you don't want him starving. And you don't want homeless people. Where Kesey's bus will stop, nobody knows. One day at the San Jose Egyptian Museum. The next in Berkeley to read from his new children's book. I don't mean lunch time, snack time, little I'm hungry. The day after at a San Francisco book fair. The biggest reaction that we get is not from fans. It's from 12-year-olds on skateboards. Everybody keeps asking deep questions about it. There's nothing deep to it. You know, it's like a kite or fireworks or a sunset or a tree in the fall. It goes by, it goes boom, and everybody sees it and their face goes boom and they're on the bus and you smile and they smile and that's it. Put your headsets on, you're about to sing. Outside, Kesey said it's time for pacifists to get involved in what he sees as a war for the environment. Does anybody know what it is? It's victory. victory. It's not peace, hell with peace. It's time for victory. I'm leaving peaceful for 20 years. And I enjoy being a famous writer. The trouble is, every so often I have to write something. <laughs> he has not written a full novel since 1964. He is working on an epic novel about Alaska. His will not be a novel about feelings and relationships. It's dull to me. Give me some animals and some machines and stuff that is a little unpredictable. Uh, let's get out of this uh, soap opera consciousness. I, I want to get back into outer space and in the woods and back where Poe is. You know, when you're reading Edgar Allan Poe or uh, Huckleberry Finn, they're out into the world having an adventure. Does life have a theme? My own life have a theme, yep. Kesey answered with lyrics by the Grateful Dead. Sometimes the light's all shining on me. Other times I can barely see. Lately it occurs to me What a long, strange trip it's been And with that, the spirit of the 60s was gone again, last seen vanishing into the hills of Oregon.
by no means do I mean to make this sound like an insult, but you have but dolls. Absolutely, but the dolls are Caroline dolls. They were, they were Meet Neil Gaiman, author and doll lover, and his inspiring creation, Coraline. I almost fell down a well yesterday, Mom. Uh-huh. I love the fact that after the movie came out, there have been lots and lots and lots and lots of little baby Coralines turning up. She's a bored young girl who opens a mysterious door, only to find a magical wonderland on the other side. Making up a song about Coraline. Everyone on the other side has buttons for eyes. Cute, until Coraline realizes her eyes are next. No way! You're not sewing buttons in my eyes! So sharp, you won't feel a thing. Ow! What do you think your attraction to the dark side of things is? I think the thing that crystallized it for me was a quote from Ogden Nash, the great American poet and humorist, where he said, where there's a monster, there's a miracle. And I realized that that, for me, is the joy of the monstrous. It's the joy of ghost fiction, the joy of vampires. It's the miraculous. The monstrous and the miraculous have been kind to Neil Gaiman. He sold millions of novels, comics, and kids books. From Sandman to Batman to Coraline, none other than horror master Stephen King has called him a treasure trove of story. Gaiman's Midwestern home is almost as spooky as Coraline's. Oh, it and moves. it moves. Consider, for example, his monstrous toy collection. Mr. Punch, who is very, very, very scary and who kills people. He's, he's like this little oh, happy goodness. serial killer. An even more curious collection could be found in his basement dungeon. I mean, a uh, library. People say, why did you move to America? And honestly, and why did you? I needed somewhere to put the books. He keeps almost every book he's ever read or written down here. I go. feel like I had this book. You probably did. The very first book he ever wrote back in 1984 was a biography of the rock band Duran Duran. These days, people who know what it is mm -hmm. um, stick this book up on eBay with my name on, and of it course. goes for 200, 300 yeah, bucks, yeah. and it's kind of ridiculous. Oh, I was the kind of kid who wanted to be a writer. While you talk to other kids about what they daydreamed about, and they wanted to be astronauts, or they wanted to be sports stars, I wanted to have written Lord of the Rings. The winner of the 2009 Newbery Medal the Newbery Medal is the highest honor a children's book author can receive, and the American Library Association gave it to Gaiman for his latest novel, The Graveyard Book. It's the story of a young boy raised tenderly by ghosts in a cemetery. Where did you come up with the idea that it takes a village of ghosts to raise an orphan boy? I had a two-year-old son and he would ride his tricycle between the gravestones, happily pedaling away. I remember looking at this little boy riding his tricycle backwards and forwards around the gravestones and thinking, he looks so at home here. The Graveyard Book has become much more than a critical favorite. It was on the New York Times bestseller list for more than a year. We were all so thrilled when you won. I enjoy your book. But his work doesn't just appeal to well-behaved librarians. Geeks are us here, man. For hardcore science fiction fans, mm. Neil Gaiman is truly out of this world. There you go. Thank you so much. You are so welcome. They line up for hours for a chance to collect his treasured signature. I think he has a lot more subtlety than J.K. Rowling, and when it comes to Edgar Allan Poe, I think he has that same creepy vibe, but it's a much easier read for someone of this generation. It was to this door that Balthazar walked. Fans of all generations sit spellbound by his voice. The other mother was huge. Her head almost brushed the ceiling of the room. Her hair writhed and twined about her head, and her teeth were sharp as knives. And listening to him read his own stuff is better than something I can't say and better than chocolate. <laughs>
Some come for the human touch. I just wanted to shake his hand. Of course, there's always one fan who goes too far, like the man who had Gaiman autograph his arm. Two or three hours later, I looked up, and it's the same guy. And he showed me my signature, which he just had tattooed, and a few little beads of blood still dripping. And I thought, wow. my weirdness meter just broke. So Neil Gaiman, author of Coraline and other dark tales, can get weirded out from time to time. Who'd have thought it? Now, you're going to stay here forever.